All right, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Mitch Stoltz. I am the IP litigation director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, and this evening we're talking about social media bans for children. And we have a distinguished panel here to talk about it. Uh, there's been a lot of talk, uh, if not outright panic, about the effects of social media on on children in terms of uh, all sorts of things, depression, body image, bullying, misinformation, uh, and uh, probably predictably when there's been such a, a strong public reaction is, 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 is there, is, there's been a lot of interest by lawmakers. And the result so far has been a number of uh, state laws um, restricting, regulating, or outright banning the use of social media by young people. Um, this, you know, is uh, both timely and also worrisome for a number of reasons, and there are really strong reasons both for and against, and that's what the panel is here to talk about. Uh, why don't we just go down the line and uh, uh, do introductions, and then we'll, we'll start right up uh, with, with getting into the subject. All right. Good evening. My name is Corey Rosenberger. I'm a uh, assistant district attorney in the Conasauga Judicial Circuit in Georgia. That's Whitfield and Murray County. Um, I've exclusively practiced criminal law for about 10 years now. Hi, I'm Heidi Tandy. I am a Florida lawyer and I'm board certified in intellectual property and I have been working in the internet space um, since the mid 90s, um, including on terms of use and privacy policies. Hi, I'm uh, Matthew Lane, Senior Policy Counsel at Fight for the Future. We are a um, nonprofit activist organization that fights for rights online uh, and, and technology rights. And uh, a lot of my life has been dedicated towards um, policy around this uh, for the past few years now, um, more than I, I wish. So we've seen uh, bills to regulate the use of social media by uh, uh, by minors in, in a, a number of states, Florida, I think Florida, Louisiana, California, Utah. Um, I believe that's... Uh, Possibly Texas, um, but uh, wondering if someone would like to give a, an overview of what some of these what, what some of these bills do. Um, so I can talk a little bit about the uh, Florida um, side of the equation. Um, first of all, noting that the Florida bill does not go in; it has been passed by the legislature. It's been signed by Ron DeSantis, but it does not go into effect. If it does go into effect, it won't be before January 1st of 2025. So we right now are kind of waiting to see what the um, state agencies do in terms of writing any more specific or clearer regulations with regard to this, and also whether any of the social media companies will sue the state of Florida to block enforcement of it and get it enjoined. And I think it would be very interesting to see um, Twitter, which I will continue to dead name, um, whether Twitter decides to sue a Republican administration with regard to this legislation, because it puts a major burden on the social media site to do age verification. Because as of now, um, under the Children's Online Privacy regulations that we've had, and I say regulations because we're talking about statutes, but also the way uh, the regulations have built up around it from the different agencies on a federal level and the way that legislation, I'm sorry, that litigation has provided some parameters. Um, in contrast to the what we've been sort of existing under for the last 20 plus years, this puts a burden on the social media um, site providers to do a significant amount of age verification. Of course, if you're age verifying your 14 and 15 year olds and your 13 year olds, then you're also going to by your nature be age verifying your 16 and up people. And that's 
you know, one of the questions that's still yet to be seen, whether that element of it is going to go into effect. Um, I think there's a lot of constitutionality questions about this because, you know, as Justice Scalia pointed out many, many years ago, you're not going to develop people into voters on their 18th birthday unless they've had an ability to interact with politics and legal issues and public affairs and civic issues um, during their teenagerhood. And there is a First Amendment right to access information that 14 and 15 year olds have. And I would just add that there's quite a lot of work in the states and I, I do not work in the states, but um, so I'm going to be a little bit vague because um, my knowledge is shallow, but they generally uh, fall under two categories. Uh, one is sort of, uh, you know, what's in the description here of like uh, age verification and bans if you're under a certain age. The other sort of vein is the California Age Appropriate Design Code, which is basically that you have to, but the attempt is, is that you have to design products in a way that is age appropriate and safe for children. Uh, in the courts, both styles of bills have not fared well um, and have tended to be struck down. Uh, most recently, the age appropriate design code in California, um, the design related aspects of that bill were found unconstitutional because they necessarily impact content because you're asking for companies to like opine on what is safe for a kid and to essentially bar them from accessing that content, which is First Amendment protected. Um, so, Corey, I was hoping you might be able to take us through some of the reasoning behind these bills. Why are why are we seeing them now? What are, what what are they intended to do? Well, um, so the the I think the intention there is uh, the a lot of lawmakers um, and politicians see this as a danger, um, specifically um, associated almost like with a drug. Um, like alcohol or marijuana or anything like that, um, that it, when you're scrolling through social media, you get a dopamine hit. Um, um, we can argue about how much of one, but, um, you do get a dope, you, you, the pleasure center of your brain dopamine, you get a hit of that, um, when you're, you know, scrolling or looking on social media. Um, personally also, um, I. I do. Ju I, I am the juvenile court prosecutor in my circuit, um, and I can tell you right now that I'd say ninety percent of my cases start on social media. Um, kids are just not as mature. They're learning, um, so they haven't learned social structures um, and that kind of thing. Um, and so I think that that's one of the, um, the one of the main concerns. Um, the flip side of that, though, is that um, kids are learning social structures and we are now in a new age of um, how do you act on the Internet? Um, and if you don't, you know, learn when you're a kid, then you're, you, you're, that, that starting point has to start somewhere. And the question from that leads to who is going to be doing that educational arm when my middle kid, who's now 21, was in think sixth or seventh grade, um, one of the parents who was, um, whether he was an FBI agent or an officer or something, um, did a presentation for all of the parents at our school that showed a um, film that the FBI had either made or commissioned about a girl who took a photo, like a selfie of herself using a flip phone. I mean, we're talking mid 2000s here because even when they showed us this film in like 2012, it was already extremely out of date. And she sh sent a photo to a friend of hers via a text and it ended up plastered all over school and it was permanent and it, you know, it wasn't a bad photo. It was literally her taking a picture of herself when she thought she looked cute going to a party wearing a perfectly fine party dress. So what the students and the parents were learning was it's okay to shame a girl for her appearance because she takes a picture and shares it around because she thinks she's cute and that's a bad thing for girls to do and it's a perfectly fine thing for boys and other girls to make fun of her for so who's giving the education to the students on how they should be acting and interacting socially so i went up to the dad after this presentation i was like so what are you teaching them about white supremacists on youtube and he was like what are you talking about and i was like the algorithm on youtube is feeding them 
information about white supremacy and racism and teaching them that that should be normalized depending on what you know threads and what um influencers they're watching on youtube and he's like well that's not part of our obligation we want to keep kids safe and i was like that's part of the safety process so I think we're better now. I hope we're better now in 2024 on what kids are being taught, but I'm not necessarily sure that the educational information that they're getting, because the teachers in California jumped on board of this design system process, even though it was going to radically make it more difficult for teenagers, high school students, college students, because there are college students who are 16 and 17, to be able to access information that is grade appropriate just because somebody thinks it's not age appropriate. And I would just I would just argue that I think we are unfortunately going down a little bit of a blind alley right now. I mean, the problem is real and I think I don't need to go through it. I'm sure everyone is aware of um, the harms on the Internet. But the but in terms of actually creating policy, it's unfortunately right now guided a lot by like pop science, not real science. Um, there's a lot more evidence now that uh, that the uh, the effects of the internet are, are mixed. Um, they tend to be on the maybe not extremes, but on the on the sides. Um, there are plenty of cases of bullying and harassment and uh, access to drugs and other things. There are also, especially for um, marginalized communities, LGBT communities, plenty of examples of people finding community and access to information that is vital to them, um, you know, in some cases for survival. Um, there are also, uh, you know, is a growing body of evidence that just cutting kids off the internet doesn't serve them any because as soon as they hit internet age, all of a sudden it's like a flood of things that they have no idea of how to react to or deal with. Um, and that, you know, that there is probably more promising in, in sort of guided internet use, the introduction of structures and social mores uh, and using it as teaching moments, other things that are healthier ways of doing this. Um, but right now, you know, it's a bit of a panic and a bit of a reaction, what's going on. And, um, and we can get into this a, a little bit later, but a lot of the policy is sort of falls in this, like what we call a nerd harder trap, which is this idea that tech companies would have already solved this problem if they just nerded harder. And so we just need to write a bill that says you are forced to nerd harder and solve this problem and then it'll go away uh, rather than like an actual good faith interest in interacting with uh, the full gamut of what goes into content moderation, what goes into design, all the trade offs, all the issues, all the problems and how to like promote a, a, a healthy environment through that sort of collaborative approach it's it's very much like this is your fault you have to solve it otherwise you're going to get so i'm wondering if any panelists have a, a, a thought about what if anything is different about social media than past forms of media and and in, in terms of concerns uh, uh uh for children and what does the science say about that so we've had variations of the social media that we currently see on the internet now. We've had that since the internet was invented. Um, I mean, I'm old, so I remember being on CompuServe and on Prodigy and America Online, and the teenagers were certainly doing the A slash S slash L um, in the chat rooms on America Online in 1993 and 1994, the same way they're, you know, sharing that same kind of content now on, you know, TikTok or on um, Discord servers. The difference now is, I think, twofold. Number one is the tracking mechanisms um, that did not exist. Like advertisers were not tracking what people were doing. Maybe they were on Prodigy, Sears owned it, um, but they weren't doing that kind of tracking on Usenet or on CompuServe or even on much of AOL um, or on LiveJournal in, you know, 2004. And so, you know, 
having an algorithm that sees what you've liked and sees what you've clicked on and what you've reacted to and what you've slowed your scroll to look at is very different from how, you know, media was being fed to people or accessed by people in the mid 2000s. So that's one of the serious differences. But on the flip side, we also had people who were lying about being 13 years old when they were really 12 so that they could access, um, you know, so what, you know, proto social media sites in 1999 and 2000. And I know, you know, a good eventually became a good friend of mine who did that and they you know recently became a priest in new york so you never know where that trajectory is going to take you yeah, i would just say that like all these problems are as old as time like before the internet was dangerous the mall was dangerous but technologies are historically an accelerant so it's just more of these problems and they're easier to find or get yourself into and so, um, and it's also easier for like stupid mistakes to uh, really catch up to you. I mean, Star Wars Kid is probably one of the earliest examples of someone who unfortunately became the butt of a joke mm -hmm. across the nation um, against his will because of the internet. And so those types of examples are, you know, enabled by the internet so the the scope and the degree of the problem can get worse as well Corey, i'm wondering from from the law enforcement perspective uh um you mentioned uh, about how uh, juvenile prosecutions begin in in uh, online forums um you know you, how is that different in the, in the current era of social media than, than, than it was in, in the in earlier forms of media um i, I i'm showing my age in the opposite direction, I guess, because I as as long as I've been prosecuting um, and practicing law, um, it, that that's kind of been the gist. Um, as far as I've, I've seen nothing but um, bullying on social media and anything like that. I, I, there wasn't a time when I was practicing law before then. But bull but again, bullying's been happening on, you know, on social media and in social media contexts. You know, I remember trying to tamp down on this when I was a baby lawyer working for the Knot, who had um wedding website company, who had um chat rooms where, you know, brides mostly in their 20s were talking about, you know, this, that, and the other. And we had to have very careful rules to stop people from bullying and frankly to stop people from doxing i had an in, i had an incident in 2001 myself where somebody did not like what i was saying on the internet about copyright law this is not a joke so she called the law firm where i was working spoke to the partner that i worked for and said one of your attorneys is talking about copyright on the internet isn't that illegal should i report her to the police 2001 so was she bullying me? I mean, we were about the same age, but here I am a lawyer. Was she bullying me to do this, to reach out to, you know, the place where I worked? But it was an absolute doxing situation. But it's very easy to dox lawyers because the bar has a record of our address and our phone number and our email address. So we're very easy to find. So as far as the bullying goes, um, that's probably the, the the main source of cases for me. Um, but um, as far as bullying goes, I see a lot. The main way that it gets prosecuted is when it happens at school um, and when there's a controlled environment where teachers can kind of see and you can schools can make a lot more stringent rules than, you know, criminal act or delinquent acts um, about bullying. Um, and what you, what we're seeing is schools have no way of saying, well, you know, we can't control, we can't prove when this was said, or, you know, we don't know this was said at five 30, according to the timestamp. And, you know, he must, Johnny wasn't in school when he was making fun of his classmate for, you know, being fat, being, you know, short, whatever, um, that coupled with the ease of access, um, now versus then, um, I would, gambit to say that 15 years ago um 15 20 years ago when social media was kind of in its early infancy um at least the ma mainstream um social media was in its infancy that um you know people bullied the got bullied the old-fashioned way at school or when it face-to-face -face contact or 
you know, over the phone, I guess. Um, so I want to present a sort of a hypothetical here. In, in, the, in, the, in the world we live in, uh, social media is pretty centralized. Uh, it's not to say that there, that there aren't sort of sort of long tail apps and 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 things that are that are used in particular communities and in, in for particular subjects. But 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 you know, um, and stop me if I'm wrong here. But the you know you know a lot of this is really you know under the the aegis of a few companies. Right? It's from Meta and TikTok. Uh, what you know how how does that complicate the picture of trying to protect kids online through regulation does it make it easier does it make it harder what would be different in a more atomized world where, where there were many different social media apps that, 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 that kids were using I, I mean this kind of is a good example of why this problem is so complicated because when you're talking about centralization uh Everyone's on the app, whatever that app is. Um, so if you're getting bullied, it's following you around. Um, and uh, and the app has a tremendous amount of information on you. And if its algorithms aren't designed well, uh, it's just feeding you stuff that might make you unhappy, but keep you engaged. And so that is like a, a definite significant real problem. Um, we would argue at Byte that like, some of the solutions are more privacy focused and competition focused um, that if you had smaller companies and if you had less data to feed these um, addictive algorithms that in a lot of ways that would help take a lot of the pressure off of the problems you're seeing um, but on the other side you know with with smaller companies you have less resources to do things like content moderation which is incredibly hard um, and so there you fall into some some other issues as, as how do we, you know, make sure that they are hiring enough people to find dangerous and illegal content and uh, derank it, delist it, not show it to certain classes of people, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, it's all trade offs. Um, you know, these are conversations that we should be having um, that are unfortunately not not really be having. Um, but but it is something that requires a holistic solution and uh, a lot more conversations directly with uh, technologists, experts, content moderators, other folks like that. And 10, 12, 15 years ago, there was interest by schools and educators in, from a media literacy perspective to teach kids how to properly use Instagram or, you know, they I think they still do it with LinkedIn to some extent, but Instagram and Twitter and, you know, how to do Google searches and how to utilize, you know, YouTube for educational purposes. And I'm not sure that that's happening anymore because there's been so much of a scare tactic by schools and by school boards so the things are you know it's now banned in certain locations for students to be able to utilize social media accounts in connection with their class whereas you know 12 12 years ago 10 years ago eight years ago kids were learning how to set up an instagram account for their club or for their sport and someone was teaching them here's how to block words and here's how to utilize hashtags and here's how to you know here's how to do all these different things and these days i don't know how many kids who are coming onto threads or who are coming onto tiktok know that you can go through it and block certain words so that they will never cross your timeline and to be able to utilize that feature as a sort of self-controlling mechanism for avoiding things that you don't want to see, to be able to know that you can turn off autoplay for videos so that nobody is going to send you a screamer or nobody is going to send you literally snuff videos that kids do send to each other if you have um, you know, if you have auto autoplay turned off, and that's the kind of thing that could be legislated. If there was legislation that said social media entities based in the United States with over X um, users or over X hours per day cannot have autoplay of audio or video, then it would reduce some of the harm outcome, and that wouldn't be a content-related thing. But nobody's interested in doing that because it's small. Mm. 
So let's shift gears a little bit and, and, and talk about the, the the bills that are out there. Um, there is a range of approaches between the sort of outright bans on, on, on one end and you know, the, the, the California age appropriate design code maybe on, 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 on the other end, which is not an outright ban, but, but, but does include a, a notion of estimating user's age. Um, wondering uh, what, what, what y'all think about, uh, uh, the, I guess, the, 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 the relative merits of, of the, the, the California approach or the Florida approach. I don't think the Florida approach has any merits if that's not <laughs> pretty obvious already. Um, but yeah, if you I want think, to address it. I think that both approaches get it wrong. I think that both approaches are uh, definitely going to be dead ends mainly due to the First Amendment. Um, kids do have First Amendment rights. And, you know, these bills have sort of run the gauntlet you know, unsuccessfully several times now. And so it's time for a different solution. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the, I think that both bills ignore how the internet actually works. And so when you talk about age verific verification, like age verifying everyone is uh, extremely expensive. Um, the free speech coalition estimates it's about like, I think it was like between 80 cents and a buck 20 per person per visit. If you're not like tracking them as cookies, um, to age verify someone with like any degree of, of reliability. And, and I say any degree, like they're still not reliable. There's still ways around it. Kids are smart. They can bypass it. Like who is a kid who has been able to bypass their, their parents restrictions on them. Um, so, uh, so yeah, there's that problem, uh, on the design aspect, I, I think that and the more I get to know the people writing these bills and kind of respect that they have, you know, that they're coming into this with, with, um, some degree of, of, uh, you know, wanting to solve a problem, the more I, I hate insulting them, but like. It is lazy writing and that like it is like you tech companies solve this problem. And the problem with that is, is that tech companies are cost avoiders. So when you say uh, you can't have any content that damages kids and they say, well, we're not going to be able to figure that out. You just tell us what you don't want the kids to see. And then they say, well, these these things and they say, fine, we're just going to shadow ban them all from the Internet. Like that is the cheapest way of solving that problem and that is literally the government imposing content controls and so that avenue is just never going to really jive with the first amendment um there's a bill that we've been fighting for this reason uh called the kids online safety act it's a federal bill that's based on the california bill um now that the california bill has sort of run into the buzzsaw of strict scrutiny under the first amendment uh because of this um they are having to sort of rewrite the bill. Unfortunately, the, the sort of framework is still just flawed. And so there's not a lot you can do to fix it. Uh, if I were to personally, you know, and again, like I think they were kind of in early stages of, of really being able to like come together and figure out real solutions uh, overall. I think it's holistic, but the direction I would sort of go towards is, is that there needs to be some way of the government incentivizing with carrots or sticks the investment in good content moderation. And I sort of met content moderators. I went to TrustCon. I chatted with them. And sort of the impression I got was is that they are a cost center for the company. The companies are investing as much as they believe necessary. Like Twitter famously got rid of most of them. And we can see what happened to Twitter soon. Mm -hmm. um, but... For the most part, like they're sort of underwater dealing with like criminal gangs from like China and uh, other stuff. And when it comes to like speech issues of what's harmful, it's so squishy and hard to figure out that like that is work that is like extremely hard and like, you know, uh, to the extent that they can avoid it, they probably will in favor of these like out and out illegal activities and other things. So. Um, there just needs to be more resources put into that, um, perhaps even sort of like open source models and other things to sort of help people deal with these issues 
at scale reliably. Um, but yeah, that's my opinion. So um, I have some very strong feelings about um, Florida and California, among other things, but trying to think about it, you know, from a more positive perspective, like what might work? And again, media literacy um, might work, but then you get into the issue of who controls what people are being taught. And there are a lot of people who think that they know best for kids who, as the mom of a teenager and two who were until recently teenagers, um, I, I don't trust them to make the decision for what is, you know, viable or, you know, worthwhile media literacy. And I also say this as somebody who um, got into college at 16 and started at 17 and who knows a lot of kids who, you know, start taking college classes or at least AP classes at 13 and 14 years old. And I think it's hugely problematic to say that a 17 year old who is literally in college living away from home or a 16 year old who's been emancipated should have these restrictions put on what they're able to access on the Internet whether it's on social media or, you know, from from another perspective, because if we're going to let 16 and 17 year olds be college students, then they need to be able to do the same kind of coursework that their friends whose birthday, you know, who happen to be a year older are able to utilize. I mean, everybody knows that in your average year especially now more post pandemic in your average you know grade level there's going to be kids whose birthdays span a 16 month time frame and to let the younger ones not be able to have the same education as their peers in the same grade is hugely disadvantageous from an educational perspective plus all of the times that the legislation says any website that markets itself to kids under the age of 18, in other words, through 17 years old, is basically saying that colleges and universities, um, sports programs, um, summer programs, all of those have to engage in age verification, museums and libraries as well. And I don't know about you guys, but I would rather my college and university spend money educating or safety or frankly better food than doing age verification for all the 16 year olds who are coming to look at that college and see if they want to go there in three years. And and that's a really good point. I want to tease out a little bit more that sort of shows how difficult this problem is. In COSA, some of the better grounded sections of that bill, the Kids Online Safety Act, are the sort of parental and user tools to allow more control over your account, what you see, the tools you have to sort of like limit your own access to content that you don't want to see, uh, whether that be like eating disorder content or suicide content or any of the like the bad stuff um, to give those sort of tools in the hands of the users. And I think that like there's a logical leap that those tools should also be in the hands of parents. And I don't know that I would necessarily disagree to a certain extent, but um, the problem you run into is how many people in this room have known someone that had or had any experience with parents who are antagonistic or you know have adversary relationships with their kids, especially if their kids come out as gay or anything like that? Um, if you give those parents uh, tools that allow them to look at like things like their search history or what content they have access to or anything like that, like you are potentially outing those kids. You are potentially allowing, uh, uh, you know, in, in situations where there's divorce or step parent, people that claim rights over a kid that they shouldn't have to claim control over a kid that they shouldn't have. And so there is like literally no way that a tech company is going to have the capacity or ability to figure out who has the rights over uh any particular child to make decisions on their behalf. So, I have yeah. Could you come to the mic? Yeah, it's just for the that way the folks online can hear us. Yeah. I do employment. I, I, I just wonder about. And your company does hire people seventeen and under. How to say? Oh wait. Okay. So I'll step back because we're getting feedback. Sorry. Everybody in the room. Oh, there we go. Okay. 
So I'll try this again. So don't you think, and I just want to get your viewpoint, that legislation, legislators are being somewhat schizophrenic because at the same time that as you're talking about it, they're trying to limit access by children and other people to the internet, they're expanding the, um, the amount of work children can actually do, right? So I don't know if this is an area that you look at, but a number of legislatures have made it easier for 14 and 15 year olds to go to work that the construction industry and other people are pushing to allow them to work during school year as opposed to only on the summer and so now you've got these legislatures on the one hand are saying you're old enough that you can go out and get a job but you're not mature enough so you're mature enough to like wield a hammer and build build something but you're not mature enough to look at the internet just seems the, and the same legislatures are doing this. It just seems very odd. So, 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 so the, the, the guiding principle for many legislatures on uh, legislators, unfortunately, is something must be done. I have done something. <laughs> something has been done. Yeah. I, you know, as a as a kid that mostly raised himself, I think that the capacity for young people to gain maturity is is vastly underestimated. And every time I see a study on this, there seems to be evidence that the more uh, free will and agency you give a kid, the better they're able to sort of learn uh, how to be functioning adults. Um, however, like that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be guardrails and safety, you know, measures in some way. Like it, it also scares me how much a, a an an oopsie on the internet can follow you throughout life. Um, and I think that there needs to be a lot of education about like, never take a picture of yourself nude, never share a picture of yourself nude in any digital format, uh, unfortunately, unless you want, you know, potentially the world to see it. You know, other sort of like safety measures, um, you know, uh, yeah, I, I think that there does need to be a lot of just help and guidance as well. Telling kids every, you know, 10 weeks or so from the time they're 11 on that just because the um, app notifies you if somebody takes a screenshot of what you sent to them doesn't mean that it will notify you if somebody points another phone at it and takes a photograph of it and you know the internet is permanent and i you know i used to do this class for something in florida called women of tomorrow and every single time i would tell the kids you know just because you find out when it's a screenshot doesn't mean you know if somebody's pointed a phone at it and every single time they would all go oh. every single time for four years some you know not the same kids each time but every single time that was the reaction it never occurred to them and yeah their brains are still developing and they're not necessarily going to figure this out on their own but a good media literacy ecosystem will manifest it and there's some good stuff out there on the internet you can go and you know find um you know through crash course or something like that there's good educational information out there youtube's created some useful things on its own even within the tiktok platform there's some good stuff in their faqs but you have to know to seek it out and if the schools aren't incorporating it then kids aren't necessarily going to get it um, when, you know, when they need it. And teaching it once when they're 11 or 12 or 14 is not going to carry the way through. Plus the things they're utilizing change during that time frame. So the, the, the issues you're raising about privacy, uh, you know, I, I think should maybe lead us back to what, uh, you know, what legislatures and courts ought to do. And the California Age Appropriate Design Code is a good example of that. It's, it's a, it's a, it was, it's a big complex bill um, that includes both uh, uh, this this notion that we talked about uh, uh, about determining what's harmful to to children and then and then restricting them from access to those things that are harmful. Uh, it also included a number of provisions around privacy of of children's information. Um, the uh, federal trial court uh, initially. Uh, had um, banned enforcement of both parts of the law. Um, the appeals court uh, uh, upheld the, the the temporary ban on enforcement uh, of the um, 
access to information and 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 harm to children uh in general uh, part of the law but uh uh um uh, for now, left the the privacy provisions intact. So, um, from both both the uh, legal point of view, the First Amendment analysis, but also from a practical point of view, can can we pass laws to protect children's privacy that don't infringe on their freedom of speech? So, I I'm actually really happy with the updated decision by the the circuit court because you know my organization is is a strong believer in privacy as one of the most important uh things to turn to to solve a lot of these problems and you know kids deserve privacy i think that the original decision went too far for us and the new decision um definitely improved it i know that the argument is that um companies have a First Amendment right to write these algorithms and not be regulated in some ways. And I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. Um, and so, so yeah, I think that like, in a lot of ways, protecting kids is about protecting their privacy because they're going to make mistakes. And the easier that is to keep those mistakes private and from leaking on the internet and the lower access people have to it. I think that like, you know, one of the one of the very sticky issues that we have ch chatted about that is, that is, I think, difficult for people is, is that there are problems that happen when you have strong and encryption of messages um, and that there can't be a like person in the company who is like looking over and making sure that everything is OK, <laughs> you know, in these messages in which, you know, like real abuse could happen. But on the other hand, if one teenager sends another teenager a nude, terrible decision, uh, at least only that other teenager, you know, has access to it, assuming they don't share it. Um, and so the opportunities for that to leak out are lower. But when employees have access to that, like there are a lot of terrible employees at these companies. I mean, you know, I was on a panel the other day where they talked about a picture from a Roomba that leaked um, of a woman on the toilet. Like, I think it, the obvious source from that picture was an employee at one of these companies. So, you know, having tighter control on this information on these mistakes is is part of protecting kids. So one of the other interesting things about privacy law is its intersection with copyright law and utilizing especially when it comes to photographs um utilizing um copyright act to manifest control over images or video that find its way out onto the internet if you're the person who took a selfie and you shared it with somebody foolishly and it's now gotten itself out there then you can utilize the digital millennium copyright act and you can have it taken down and google will make it unsearchable and all of the um, you know, all the websites that find themselves, you know, searchable through Google, it'll come down. And yes, it probably will live forever on the dark web, but it won't be the kind of thing that pops up when somebody searches for your name. And knowing, knowing that you have that kind of control, knowing that you have the copyright in the photo that you took, or if the person who took it is someone that you're still, you know, friendly with, um, they can do the takedown on your behalf, or they can assign the copyright to you, and then you can do it yourself going forward. And having that knowledge would really be hugely beneficial to teenagers, to young adults who don't think that there's anything that they can do. One of my friends in Miami, she literally does internet porn takedowns. That's what her career is built on. She does it, you know, for influencers, for regular people, um, you know, guys, girls, ir irrelevant. And there are processes in place to be able to try and get that off of the internet so that people hopefully don't panic. But on the flip side, the coming onslaught of AI and the creation of deep fakes where you might not have ever had a photo taken, but somebody is going to take a photo that you took or that somebody took of your face, which you still own the copyright in and do something with that. You can still utilize the DMCA to 
um, have the entire image taken down because it utilizes a portion of something that you hold the copyright in. And you have the ability to say that, you know, this is an unauthorized derivative work and I want it taken down. And there's literally no information about that that kids are getting on a high school or college level. It would be really easy for colleges to like build this into their orientation package if they don't think the high schools are teaching it properly. They're not doing that. We should probably mention at this point that the limitations of the copyright approach, which is that the copyright belongs to the photographer, not the subject of a photograph. So while that that approach might work pretty well for selfies, uh, it won't work at all for uh, photos taken by another person. Unless you get it assigned to you. And it's really easy to get a copyright assigned to you. All you have to do is have a writing between the two people, which can be a text. Yeah, I know. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I know you know that. I'm, you know, the the world also probably knows that. But, but that, so again, it assumes that the photographer is cooperating in in the in suppressing the photo. Right. But if you know that a photo is being taken of you, you know, in a consensual relationship, then getting the rights to it assigned to you at that point should be part of any dialogue between a happy couple or more than couple. So. You're, you're saying you think teens should be asking for copyright assignments? Yes, they should. They should, they, should when be educated. they should be educated to know that they can do that. I actually did try to create this in an app format about 10 years ago, um, like an automatic copyright assignment um, in, in photos thing. After that Oscar photo was taken, which was supposed to be taken by Ellen, and all the contracts said that it was supposed to be, and then what, Bradley Cooper was the one who ended up taking it. So he's the one who ended up with the copyright in it, and hoops had to be jumped through, jumped through so that other people who, like, the Oscars could use it correctly because it suddenly was not the copyright of the person they thought it was going to end up with. Oops. I, I will say that one of the hottest areas of policy right now is trying to solve the non-consensual generated image problem. The unfortunate thing, and, and this is a little getting off topic, but um, a lot of the interests that are involved right now are like Hollywood. And so the bills that are moving tend to be drafted from the perspective of protecting large, famous artists, and people, and not from protecting uh, a lot of the average people who are going to be caught up in this coming problem. So um, I know that VR, I believe EFF and other folks are working on trying to push for um, more, more uh, better solutions for, um, for just average people. Um, and we just in endorsed AOC's Defiance Act, which is targeted this as well. So let's, oh, sorry, please, Corey. Well, I was just gonna piggyback off that as to the, the celebrities AI generated image versus the the regular person. Um, I've seen a surge in the past year in juvenile court, um, specifically of that of people saying getting AIs to create images and then sharing that image on Snapchat, Instagram, or, or other other areas. And there is not a crime in Georgia that I can find um, that adequately, you know serves uh, as a deterrence um, for kids doing that uh, let's let's pause at this point because we're, we're nearing the hour and 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 take questions uh and if you would please come up to the mic hi thanks for uh sharing your wisdom with us um, I guess uh, nobody else was going to ask a question, so I thought I'd just um, maybe try to think of something about, like, <laughs> just thinking about um, the issue with, like, I heard something years ago that, they're, like, everybody has so many doppelgangers, and um, a friend of mine sent me a photo from somebody that I didn't know, like, a complete stranger, and this was, like, 10 years ago, so I think it was, like, before AI, and this guy looked exactly like me. And I was like, I knew it wasn't me because he was sitting with these people that I don't know. Um, but I couldn't believe how much he looked like me. And I guess he lives in the Atlanta area somewhere. Um, so I guess maybe the question is, is there like a workability or like a justiciability, if that's a word, like how can the law be effective in policing these kind of rights when or, or how does it get involved when you have somebody 
especially if someone has a face that's like more generic for lack of a better term not to say that that makes someone less attractive but if there's like more people with your face because it doesn't have anything that really stands out like maybe it's very symmetrical um and so you have more doppelgangers than another person and I, then so there actually is uh an interesting problem so um i'll get a little bit more in depth than i probably should but the Defiance Act uh, that we just endorse, all it does is update the Violence Against Women Act um, to say that, you know, people have a right to sue if your likeness is used in a, um, a non-consensual intimate image, you know, essentially like pornography using your face, uh, whether it be Photoshopped or AI generated. Um, but one of the problems that we ran into when we were trying to figure out what we thought the best policy would be is is that there is i think probably rightly a first amendment protected ability of um people to generate like just not based on anyone living just random pornography using some of these ai tools like it might be weird but it's not necessarily like something that we should be i guess uh criminalizing people over but um there is a chance for a lot of reasons that the AI could spit out an image that looks exactly like a real person, including that the AI just accidentally was oversampling a, a real person or um, was, you know, calling a, a person in the database. And so how do you deal with that problem where there is no intent to generate that image? And we honestly had no idea how to solve that problem. So if anyone has any thoughts there, I would appreciate it because uh, AI is making things really weird in the policy space, and uh, it's making it harder and harder to figure out how to make laws that, that do the thing you want them to do and not do something completely different. I mean, the worst part is to say that one of the ways to deal with this is to destigmatize those kinds of issues and destigmatize the idea that if somebody sees a picture of, you know, somebody that looks like whoever on the internet doing something untoward the first presumption should be hey maybe it's not actually that person doing the thing and people's brains just do not work that way and it's really frustrating but if there was you know that perspective that was you know unenforceable but manifest in the world then i think that we would all be in better shape it's often easier to point out the, the, the way the way not to do things than to come up with a way to do things because, because these are very hard problems. But uh, there's a uh, federal bill just introduced that, that would essentially create a property right in one's likeness. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was the bill I was talking about. It was written from the perspective of a very wealthy uh, artist and not. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 just contains you know you, you know not not nearly is not not nearly solicitous enough of um, the you know, use of uh, a, a real a real person's real likeness in uh, uh, in, in a sort of legitimate work of art or, or or fiction or criticism or or history or education. Thank you all for being here. Um... I actually just saw a Snapchat filter of someone's face that looked exactly like a friend and shared that with my friend to see if it was her. It wasn't. Uh, so I think it was AI generated. But um, I'm not super familiar, uh, well versed in tech, but for data leaks, like for a picture that someone may have sent, um, is that tied at all to data retention on the media company's side? And is there any like anything that we have control over? for maybe picture retention specifically and having them not hold on to things for so long? Part of the problem on this is that there is um, there's legislation and there is administrative regulations uh, with regard to how long certain data and information needs to be retained by a company for legal purposes, plus you've got statute of limitations. So as long as courts will say that some that spoilation of evidence has happened because you deleted something in under you know four years, five years, whatever, um, companies are not going to want to delete that 
stuff from their websites. And that's why, you know, even for, um, you know, privacy things, things have to be retained because if you don't retain it and somebody sues you over it at some point down the line and you don't have that evidence retained, then the um, court's perspective will, you know, see it negatively towards you. And that's a huge risk for companies to take. And there hasn't really been a balancing of those issues from you know a legislative perspective on the federal level and even if there was you can answer this for me i don't know how that would impact the state's determinations just because the federal rules of civil procedure change doesn't mean that the individual states do and we've got states and districts and you know um and territories who all have their own laws and we have localities who have their own laws and some of them have their own civil procedure processes so how would that work um i have no idea um, <laughs> <laughs> especially given um the chaos that would if we have 50 different policies this is this screams commerce clause and you know federal yeah. government um, yeah uh, so i'm a strong advocate for uh privacy respecting technologies. Um, I personally use Signal quite a bit. I know a lot of people do. There's lots of other examples of that. But basically, there's a sliding scale of protection that you have on any service that you use. Um, services that have real end-to-end -end encryption, uh, only you and the recipient have access to whatever that is, a text or an image. Um, the thing I like about Signal, and it's a feature that are on other uh, similarly situated apps, are is that you can delete things, including pictures for you and for them. Uh, it doesn't protect you against screenshots. It doesn't protect you against, so there's, you know, again, it is a harm reduction. It's not a harm, complete harm avoidance type technology. Um, some of the problems that exist on uh, non-encrypted is that um, the employees of the company have access to personal messages. A lot of people don't realize this. And sometimes they're actually expected to monitor those messages for illegal activity and improper activity. And some of those employees are not fully ethical. And so some of that stuff can get diverted or shared or whatever. Um, and obviously there's also problems with the expectations of privacy on like Discord or things where it's like, there's again, a sliding scale of who's involved. And I know I, I chatted with the um, the policy person at Discord that like this is a, a significant problem for them to figure out, which is like how do they deal with the tension between moderation and tracking for illegal behavior versus uh, permitting people privacy for the reasons we're talking about, and sort of like how big of a chat or how big of a server uh is you know going to be monitored versus um private and this is a problem that all companies have i think that for the most part there are some companies that uh prioritize solving it more than others and uh, i would definitely say that like when you're on a company that treats you as a product um to be a lot more uh, aware and and self and have more self preservation and knowledge uh, about how those things work, um, and definitely engage in some tech literacy. I, and I just want to point out, just globally, like I don't think it should all be the user's responsibility to do all of these very complicated things and know these complicated things. But in today's world, that's where we are. <laughs> well, I think we're at time, so please join me in thanking the panel. Uh, and please review this panel on the DragonCon app. Uh, uh, the more positive reviews uh, we get, the bigger room we get next year. Thank you. Also, I have EFF stickers if, if anyone would like up here.